If you've ever played any of the Animal Crossing games, you probably remember obtaining some of or at least hearing about the Golden Tools. The Golden Tools of Animal Crossing each provide a unique boost over their normal counterpart, and with the exception of a few, are pretty difficult to obtain, with some of the most sought after being the Fishing Rod and the Net, which can end up taking up to a year to unlock, since obtaining them requires you to catch every single fish or bug respectively, with all of them having specific times of the year that they're even available to be caught. But a handful of folks weren't satisfied with waiting a full year, and instead of just changing the date on their GameCube and running around until all of the fish and bugs were caught, they decided to document every single aspect of Animal Crossing to figure out the most optimal route. And when I say every single aspect, there is no exaggeration behind that statement. Every single item, furniture, wallpaper, fossil, music, insect, fish, where the fish spawn, what their vision angle is, how far they can see, what percentages they spawn in every single weather type, day of year, body of water, every last inch of this game has been completely documented. And with all of this information at our fingertips, this is how to unlock every single golden tool in the fastest way possible. Animal Crossing has a handful of different speedrun categories, from the most popular one being the all debts category, where your main goal is to pay off all of your debts to Tom Nook, to the least popular one, all golden tools. But whichever one you do decide to run, every single one starts off pretty much the same. The game starts off with you on your way to your Animal Crossing village on the train. The initial part is just mashing through a ton of text boxes, making your name as well as the town name an exclamation point, as it is the first option within the text box, and arriving at your town. You are then greeted by Tom Nook who tells you that he has some houses for sale, and you then have an option of four houses to pick from, with either of the two being the most optimal locations to save time throughout the run. And after selecting a house, you then have to go back to the town map to see if this run is even worth finishing. The map of Animal Crossing is separated into 25 acres on a grid, and the main thing you're looking for when viewing the map is for the post office as well as Tom Nook's store to be in the A2 and A4 locations. In a perfect scenario, Nook's cranny would be in A2 and the post office would be in A4, but either one typically means the run is worth continuing. A couple of other decent things to look for are the locations of the neighbors within the town, but typically do not call for a reset, but they're nice to have when they're relatively close. The next part of the run is to introduce yourself to every single villager in the town, and one thing that is completely up to RNG in the run is that every villager in Animal Crossing has a different personality type, and depending on their personality type, they will have different dialogues when talking to them or delivering them gifts, with some of the dialogues lasting a decent amount longer than the others. But similar to the locations of the houses, the personality types can save or lose a handful of seconds, but aren't make or break for the all golden tools run, as there will be more impact RNG later on in the run. And while running around to meet your villagers, it is important to note a few things about the acres within your town. In order to get the golden axe, you have to have perfect town status, which requires you to have 16 perfect acre points. And in order to be worth one point, an acre has to have between 12 and 14 trees. So while running through talking to the villagers, it is worth marking which acres have less than 12, already have the perfect amount of trees, and which one have more than 14. This checking step can be done throughout the run, but as you're running through most of them anyways, it is typically worth it unless you're going for the golden net and rod speed run as well. In Animal Crossing speedruns, there are categories for each tool individually, the golden rod and net rod category, and lastly, them all together. And when going for all golden tools, the best possible route consisting of doing these steps pretty much simultaneously, as that'll bring the quickest time. While traversing acres to catch specific bugs as well as fish, you can also make sure to have each acre gain you a perfect acre point. But since the all golden tools run is the least popular of the bunch, a typical strategy when going for all tools is to just go for the golden rod and net category first, which if gained a good time, will just overflow into the all tools run. This method doesn't really lose a whole bunch of time, as the main thing you're losing out on is just having to re-enter a handful of acres to plant a few trees, and this allows for runners to compete in a more popular category while also preparing to extend into a second one. The last thing to be on the lookout when talking to your villagers is to see if there is a pond somewhere on the map, as there are some fish that can only spawn in a pond, and for some reason, you are not guaranteed to get one in a town, which could just kill the run. After meeting all of your villagers and returning to Nook's Cranny to start your chores, he will give you some trees as well as flowers to plant, which you can just run outside and spam plant all of them, except for one that needs to be placed outside of Tom Nook's Acre for bugs that will need to be caught later on in the run, while also making sure that that flower is anything but a tulip, as tulips will not spawn certain bugs. And then all that is left is to finish completing Tom Nook's chores, which involves delivering a package to a neighbor, writing a letter, which can be blank to save some time, placing an ad on the bulletin board, which can also be blank, as well as a couple more deliveries. But once finished, the main section of the run can begin. 
After completing all of the chores, you can sell the remaining items in your inventory and buy all of the tools that you'll need. In this game, every single item can be bought by entering a very specific code. So even if it's not in the shop, you have access to whatever you want. In this section, it's basically an APM check, as every item is categorized by a 28-digit code that has to be typed in as quickly as possible. But it's also worth making sure it is correct, as spending a couple of extra seconds making sure it's right is much better than entering in something wrong and redoing the entire process. But after obtaining the axe, net, and rod, you just have to purchase some non-tulip flowers from Tom, as well as a shovel, and head outside. And the way that the bug and fish spawns work in Animal Crossing is that each individual bug or fish has a unique spawn rate depending on the month, time of day, and weather condition. And each will only have certain locations in which they spawn in, such as a pond or a river for a fish, or a tree or a flower for a bug. And since waiting for each specific month obviously won't work, the main goal when routing out a golden run is to minimize the amount of times that you'll have to reset the date of your town. There are different optimal routes for fish only, bug only, and both. But the general idea is you want to start in months that have the highest amount of bugs and fish available, while also leaving you open to catch some of the rarer fish later on, while also leaving the option for rain to not make or break your run. And what I mean by this is some runs will begin with months such as June or May, which each have a 1% spawn rate for goldfish. But if the goldfish is the very last fish to be caught from those time frames, you can just continue along as you'll have more opportunities to catch the goldfish later when you go in. September. Or for fish like the coelacanth, which requires rain as well as a few specific months, it's good to have that option a handful of times as rain cannot be guaranteed or manipulated. Basically, for the very rare catch fish and insects, it is best to try and plan out a route where they have a few chances to spawn as it'll be more likely to find while you're catching all the other things that are a lot more limited. The first month and time frame that we start in is July during the daytime, which has one of the largest pools of potential things to catch. And our initial goal is to head to acre A2 and A3 to attempt to spawn bugs by retransitioning each acre. And the best way to get this to work is to head towards A2 and A3. And the reason we want this acre is because these acres guarantee to not spawn rivers or ponds, which can really mess with the spawn chances of insects. And by removing a couple of trees and re-entering and leaving each acre, there will be a new chance for a bug to spawn on each tree. And if after a couple of transitions, no bug ends up spawning, you can run a full acre away and completely reset the spawns. But the main things you want to catch in the July daytime are the walker, brown, and robust cicadas, the jewel beetle, and the banded dragonfly all from trees, and the pond skater from the pond. And for the insects, this is the only time frame that these should be caught. But any common insects like the cockroach, the common dragonfly, the drone beetle, the common butterfly, or the darner dragonfly, they're always fine to grab as well as any rare ones like the longhorn beetle or the emperor butterfly, which are fantastic to find as you won't have to search hard for them in the other months. And as far as fish go, the main two catches that are needed right now are the giant snakehead, which is a 10% chance to spawn in a lake, as well as potentially the sweet fish, which can be found in later months but has a decent spawn chance in rivers with some common fish like the carp and the bluegill being grabbed along the way, as well as a rare goldfish, which can spawn in any condition, but it sits around a 1.5% chance, so whenever you find it is always good. One thing to note about bugs versus fish is that the insects are always basically caught the same. If they are stationary, you can walk up to them and swing your net, or if they're flying, you can just try to catch them out of the air. And they're very easily distinguished because you can see what the actual insect is before you catch it. But fish are a completely different story. First off, fish cannot be seen before they are caught, but in certain situations, they can be determined based on what options are on the given month, the size of the shadow, and even their vision angle, as well as view distance. Let's say you are fishing in the river and are aiming to catch an arowana, which is one of the rarest fish to find in the game with a 1% spawn rate. Every time you reload the acre and see a shadow size that isn't size three or medium, you can scare the fish away and retransition the acre to search again. But in certain months, the eel is also available to catch in the river and is also the same size as the arowana. But it is much more likely to spawn, so in most runs, this will already have been caught when searching for the arowana. So what you can do to potentially save some time is take advantage of the eel's vision angle. The eel has a vision angle of only 7 degrees, so unless the bobber is directly in front of their shadow, they will not see it and they will not go for the bite. But the arowana has a vision angle of 50. So by throwing the bobber a little bit offset of the shadow's vision angle, if the fish doesn't see the bobber, you can automatically know that it's an eel and not an arowana, and you can just reel the line back in and save time by not having to catch the fish. Knowing the vision angle as well as the vision distance can not only help you distinguish one fish from another, but it can also help you in how precise you need to be when trying to catch certain fish. But once all the completely required bugs and fish are caught, you can head on to the next month. 
And the way to skip ahead or back in time is to run to your house, save and reload the game, and before returning to your game, you can tell the villager you're talking to that you want to reset the game time. And in this run, it's always worth setting the time backwards, as weeds can spawn, which can potentially mess with spawn rates, as well as mess with your perfect town status, which will affect the golden axe later on. Another tactic used to minimize the amount of time skips that have to take place is you choose a time frame that is just about to roll over into another. So the next time that is chosen is August 31st at 11.59 p.m. And this is where you can play these runs risky or safe. The cutoff for different spawn rates is September 1st at midnight. And the only major catch that you need in August is the jellyfish. So you either give yourself one minute to catch the jellyfish, or you could be safe or extra safe. You could give yourself two or even three minutes of time to catch the one jellyfish. The only issue is that if you give yourself three minutes and catch the jellyfish immediately, you will just have to wait until the rollover into September begins to catch your next batch. And one thing to note about spawn windows is that the night and day cycles change at 9 as well as 4. So afternoon catches are from 4 p.m. to 9 p.m., nighttime catches are from 9 p.m. to 4 a.m., and so on. But even though the time cycles rotate at each 4 and 9 on the clock, the month spawn rates change at midnight. So depending on what date you choose, you can swap between two different nighttime cycles during the same nighttime window. And if you thought that wasn't complicated enough, then you're in luck, as the spawn rates only apply to fish. The spawn rates for insects are in a six cycle per day period instead of four, with each cycle lasting a different amount of time. But after catching your jellyfish within a single minute, the September catches begin. The list of fish that need to be caught in the September nighttime are the red snapper and barred knife jaw from the ocean and the salmon from the river ocean. And similar to the resummoning of insects, to resummon ocean fish, all you have to do is scare the fish away and then leave and re-enter the same acre. And if for some reason you can't scare the fish away, running two acres away will reset the spawns. And after catching all the fish, the cricket, the pine cricket, and the bell cricket are caught chirping in the bushes, which even though they aren't visible, each have three distinct chirps to know which one is hiding in each bush. And after all of the required September things are caught, the next window is to head into July at 4 a.m., which can be a heavy RNG section of the run. To start off July, the main catches that need to be made are all the remaining beetles, which for the most part have a 5% spawn rate, with the giant beetle having the lowest percent chance at just 1%, as well as the spider, which sits at 2%. The spider can be found year-round though, but as it only spawns in trees, it's worth going for since this is one of the last parts of the run where the trees are being searched through. After collecting all of the beetles on the trees, it's time to go for the arowana, which is the first time the previously mentioned view angle as well as view distance from fish can come into play pretty heavily. Another thing to look for when searching for river fish is finding an acre that bends in a 90 degree angle, very similar to this one, which this one has only one spawn location in this acre, so resetting is very easy. If it's the size of the fish you want, you can catch it and reset the acre. If it's the size of the fish that you don't want, you can just scare it off by sprinting and reload the acre very quickly by knowing where the fish is going to spawn. But during the July morning section, the main fish that you want to catch are the eel, which has the very narrow view angle, the catfish, which has a large shadow size, and most importantly, the arowana as well as the arapaima, which both only have a 1% spawn rate and which the arowana can easily be mistaken for eels or even bass, even when checking for view angles as well as view distances. And the arapama, being the only size 6 fish in the river at this time, can be checked for pretty easily. With the beetle spawn rates as well as the river spawn rates of July morning being so low, this is a section of the run that can take up a substantial amount of time as many of the river fish share shadow sizes and have to be caught in order to check if they are actually what you want. And not only is finding these fish hard to do, but the more rare the fish is in the game, the better reaction time you need, with some of the fish requiring you to react within 333 milliseconds of taking the bait before it will run away. Another fish that is good to catch while searching for the arowana is the killifish, which can be caught during most spring and summer months, so it's not a necessity during July, but it will save time in the future if it's found during this hunt. But after finding the two 1% fish, the hardest day is over, and you can move on to September daytime, with the most difficult thing being the guppy from the river. Other than the difficult catches with the guppy, most of the catches are pretty straightforward, with the only exception being the ant, where you have to buy a piece of candy, place it on the ground, and reload the acre for it to spawn. The insects that are needed on September are the grasshopper, a couple of locusts, and the mantis, followed by a few fish in the river and lake, ending off with hopefully finding a guppy in a decent amount of time. The next month is June at nighttime, and throughout this run, hitting rain is always important for at least one of the days, mainly because snails have to spawn on flowers and coelacanths in the ocean. Throughout the run, the coelacanth can only spawn at nighttime as well as during rain, and every month visited during this run meet these conditions except during the jellyfish section, it is worth grabbing the sea bass while hunting the coelacanth in order to completely finish all of the ocean fish during the jellyfish section 
and coelacanth section, which also means that inventory space is no longer important. Whenever fishing in the ocean, there's a chance to catch trash, but if your inventory is completely full, then catching trash is not an option. And up until the point of catching all of the ocean fish, it is important to keep your inventory full to prevent that from ever happening. But after clearing the ocean, it's not important for the remainder of the run. The rest of September consists of finding some of the pond fish like the frog and then searching for the giant catfish from the lake with a 10% spawn rate as well as the piranha and angelfish in the river which both only have a 1% spawn rate. Both of these fish are small in size which has a decently sized pool during this window making each of these fish a 1 out of 15 chance whenever a small size is found. But similar to before, some have pretty distinct patterns that can be used to try and avoid catching repeat fish. The piranha, for example, has a view range of 180 degrees, making it very easy to distinguish if the bobber is thrown at a very wide angle. The next section is March, which consists of catching all of the ladybugs, a handful of more common fish, and most importantly, the large char from the bottom of the waterfall, which leads into the final month of catching, which is February. The first thing to search for in the winter is the bagworm, which will fall from a tree when shaken, and throughout the entire run, shaking trees can potentially find you a beehive, which most of the time being searched for at the very end, but if a beehive ever falls during the run, it can be a decent time save when found. Another bug that can be found at any point during the run with the same spawn rate is the pill bug, which can spawn whenever a rock is hit. And after finding all of those bugs, the next bug to find is the mole cricket, which can be found by using the acre reset in the house area and digging every single hole until the mole cricket is found, which is the very last bug to catch except for the firefly, which is going to be caught at the very end of the goldenrod in that section. Then for the last of the fish, all that is needed is the bitterling, which is fairly common, as well as the koi and the stringfish, which both sit at 1% spawn rate, which after hopefully catching in a reasonable amount of time, every single fish in the game has been caught which means that the rest of the run for the most part is pretty smooth sailing. After catching all of the fish, you have to reset the game once again, head to June and make sure the year is set one year back. At the start of the day, you receive a package from Tortimer containing the golden rod, and now you can catch the firefly to catch all of the bugs. But one 30% chance of happening that can add about a minute to the run is that the goldenrod start can be a rainy day, which will make it to where fireflies cannot spawn. But even if hit, the day can just be reset and you can catch a firefly on the following day. And similar to the goldenrod, the day will start with Tortimer giving you the golden net. And for anyone going just for the golden net and rod speedrun, the timer would end on the second your character says that they got the golden rod. But for the all tools speedrun, two more tools need to be collected, but they just so happen to be the easiest of the four. In order to get the golden shovel, all you have to do is find the golden spot in the ground, dig out the money, and bury a normal shovel inside. Then once that tree is fully grown, a golden shovel will pop out. And in order to get the golden axe, as mentioned before, the only requirement is to have 16 perfect acre points in your entire town for a total of 15 days. And in order to get perfect acre points, you just have to have 12 to 14 trees within an acre, as well as not having any weeds. Which is why every time you reset the time, you keep going back a year to prevent any from spawning. One other thing to note about the perfect acres is that if there is an acre with less than 9 or more than 16 trees, this prevents perfect town status. But as each acre is completed, it can be marked off as you continue along. And while running through each acre, every time you find a fruit tree, grabbing as many as possible will allow you to plant any tree you want whenever it's needed. This section of the run is fairly straightforward, and it just requires a bit of management. And as long as you can keep track of how many acres you have with perfect points, it takes about 10 minutes to run through and add or remove the necessary amount of trees. And if you want to check to make sure that you have perfect status for sure, the wishing well can tell you what acres need work or if you have perfect status already. And after having perfect status, you just need to save and quit, reset your town one month back, leave once again, and reset back to where you were so that no weeds will affect your perfect status. By doing this, you will get your initial resetty dialogue, but this is still much quicker than resetting another time by entering your town and leaving once again. And after talking to resetty, you can head back to the wishing well, talk to Farley, and receive your third golden tool. And now that the golden axe has been obtained, all that is left is to reset one last time. Move forward yet another month and go find the tree where you buried your shovel, and by shaking the tree and picking up the shovel, the all golden tools speed run for Animal Crossing is complete. Animal Crossing speedruns are very fun to watch. Any of the runs that contain either the golden rod or net have a ton of RNG involved, but when played to your odds can be extremely entertaining to see, as well as to play whenever the luck falls in your favor. 
This game is currently being dominated by Brian MP16, who as of recording this video owns eight of the 10 world records for Animal Crossing. So if you wanna see more Animal Crossing content, definitely go check them out as this video wouldn't have been anywhere close to possible without all of their documented runs, as well as all of the extensive research done by the Animal Crossing speedrunning community. Thanks for watching.